All right. At the end of last class, we started looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As I said, this, the entire chapter is devoted to correcting the view of some in the Corinthian church that the dead will not be resurrected, meaning they'll not return to bodily life. Now, some of the Corinthians, they brought to their Christianity the normal pagan view. So I explained to you that most pagans believed that death was a one-way street to a disembodied existence. They didn't think you terminated. They thought you continued as a soul or spirit forever. And some of it, but they denied resurrection. And so some of the Corinthian Christians have brought this pagan view into the church and, and they're denying the resurrection. Though they accepted that Jesus... God incarnate had been resurrected. They denied that others, that mere humans, those who were not divine, that they would likewise be resurrected. And Paul tells them, as we will see, that the two go together. See, to deny the one is to deny the other implicitly. Now, I read first uh, verses 1 to 11 last week. Let me read it again. I'll repeat some of what I said, and then we'll pick up from there. But he says, Now I make known to you, brothers, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firm to what word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you among the first things what also I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. Afterward, he was seen by over 500 brothers at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some fell asleep. Afterward, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he was seen by me also. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not in vain. Rather, I labored more abundantly than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Therefore, whether I or they, thus we preach, and thus you believed. Now, Paul says here, Paul, he says that, uh, he reminds them that they, the gospel they receive from him is saving them. It is in the process of rescuing them from the consequences of sin and delivering them into eternal life, and it will do so provided they hold firmly to that message. And then he says that's the case. It, it is in the process of saving them. It will save them, provided they hold firmly to the message, unless you believed in vain. Unless you believed in vain. And see, their believing would be in vain. Their believing would profit them nothing if it were not true that Jesus was raised from the dead. As he says in verse 14, and again in verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, then their faith is empty, their faith is useless. And he's telling them this because as he makes clear in verse 13 and in verse 16, their denial that Christians will be resurrected implied that Christ was not resurrected. The two go together, as I said a minute ago, they go together. They are the same harvest. So to deny the one is to deny the other implicitly. It is like lightning and thunder. To say there is no thunder is to imply there is no lightning. That's how they're tied together. And then Paul says in verses 3 to 5, he reminds them of the most important tenets of the gospel that he had received and had passed on to them. And for a number of reasons, his statement there in 15 verses 3 to 5, it's widely, generally recognized to be an early creedal formula. Now a creed is just a set way, a formulaic way of expressing certain important truths 
usually in a way that facilitates memorization. And Paul says in verse 3 that he had previously passed on to the Corinthians the elements of this creed. And he's referring to his early, his visit to Corinth. He's writing this around A.D. 54. He had visited them about four years earlier. So he's talking about around 50 when he had been there and he had previously delivered to the Corinthians the elements of this creed. And so he says he, says he, did, he delivered it to them earlier and then he says earlier than that he had received it. Okay, he had received it, the elements of that creed. So we know that at least within 20 years of Christ's death, and most likely within about six years of Christ's death, because that would have been when Paul had first met with the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, as you see in Acts chapter 9, verse 26 to 29. We know that at least within 20 years, when he delivered the elements of this creed to those in Corinth, which he said he had received before he delivered it to them in A.D. 50. And he most likely received it when he first visited the church in Jerusalem about six years after Jesus' death. And this is significant because it tells us that there was a set statement. There was a creedal formula that was circulating that early that talked not only about Jesus having been raised from the dead, but that asserted he was seen by Peter in the twelve. And when I talk about the, the, the class on the historical case for the resurrection, you see why that's so important. Because you have people who want to claim, well, no, 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 this idea of Jesus being raised, it's this latter-day thing many, many, many years down the road, and they just projected this back onto it. Well, how can that be? When within 20 years we already have a creed of form, probably within six years. We have a, a formulaic statement of the gospel that includes the fact that the resurrected Christ was seen by Peter and the Twelve. So that puts this baby way back there. So anything that doesn't acknowledge that and deal with that fact is, is insufficient. And that's a, that's a very significant thing. Now Paul, having received this tradition from men... You see, that's not inconsistent with what Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, that he did not receive his gospel from human beings, but through a revelation of Christ. It, this isn't inconsistent with that. Because in Galatians, he's referring to the gospel itself. The truth of Christ's atoning sacrifice and resurrection and its meaning for Gentiles. He is not in Galatians talking about a creedal formula, a specific shorthand way of expressing those truths. He received the gospel, not from men, from Jesus, but the particular formulaic expression, the creedal formula, which was consistent with the gospel that he had earlier received. That that particular creedal formula he received when he visited the church in Jerusalem. Here's what a Catholic scholar, Joseph Fitzmaier, says in his commentary on 1 Corinthians, he says in Galatians, he, Paul, is referring not to the formulation, but to the content of the gospel as a whole. In using tiny logo, what word, in 1 Corinthians 15, 2, he insists on the very formulation which he's inherited from tradition. So I just wanted to point that out to you because I know your wheels would be turning and going, how do those two things fit together? So there you have that. Now in verses 6 and 7, they don't appear to be part of the familiar creed and probably don't belong to the gospel which Paul preached to the Corinthians. Paul probably adds the information about these additional appearances which he no doubt had taught at Corinth. But he probably adds this uh, information about these additional appearances to bolster the case for the reality of Christ's resurrection. And also to remind them of his own place in that resurrection tradition. When he says, you know, I saw him. He appeared to Peter, he appeared to the twelve, and then he adds these other examples. And he includes the appearance that was given to him or made to him. Now Paul says the first item of this creed that he had passed on to them and that he had previously received is that Christ died for our sins. Now as Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, Verse 4, 
Jesus gave himself for our sins. And he says elsewhere in 1 Corinthians, he says, Our Passover lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. All right, so, so in Corinthians, Paul says the Passover lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. He says in a couple of places, you were bought with a price. And he refers in Corinthians to the weak brother as the brother for whom Christ died. And see, this, this idea that he died for our sins... That presupposes alienation between God and humans because of sin. And it means that Jesus, who is the Christ, God's anointed one, he died to pay the just penalty for those sins and to overcome that alienation. As you've heard many times, the cross is where God's justice and his mercy where his holiness and his love are expressed simultaneously. See, because in his love, God desires to forgive us of our sins. He sent his son Jesus to take upon himself the punishment for that sin. So in the cross, God is able to satisfy both his holiness And his love, both his justice and his mercy. In other words, through the cross, God is able to forgive justly. He is able to forgive righteously. He is able to forgive in a way that is consistent with his nature. And so when he says here that that Christ died for our sins, all of that's wrapped up in that. And he says that he died for our sins according to the scriptures. Well, how according to the Scriptures? Well, in the Scriptures you see that deliverance through sacrifice is a regular part of the Old Testament. But more specifically, there's Isaiah 53 which describes the one who as a lamb led to slaughter took away the sins of the people. So you have this, he died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And then the second item of the creed that Paul received and that he had passed on to them is that he he was buried. And in this creed, this functions to verify the reality of Jesus' death. That he was buried. And in this context, it emphasizes the fact that what was resurrected is what was buried. He was buried and raised. The tomb was empty. He's not talking about some kind of spiritual a uh, non-physical, ghostly thing. They all knew about that. That's not what he's talking about here. Not some purely spiritual phenomenon. The tomb was empty. And then the third item in the, in the creed is that he was raised on the third day. And he says, according to the Scriptures. Now that phrase, according to the Scriptures, may relate only to the part he was raised. He says he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. So according to the scriptures may only pertain to the part that he was he was raised. And we see a number of places in, in the New Testament in Acts chapter 2, verse 25 to 36, Acts 13, 35 to 37. There you see they go back and they appeal to Psalm, Psalm 16, 8 to 11, Psalm 1101, to show that those Old Testament writings, those Psalms that they bear witness to the Messiah's resurrection. And you can also see that resurrection alluded to in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10 and 11 and 54, 7. Now, if Paul means that, that according to the Scriptures, he was raised from the dead, on the, raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures, if according to the Scriptures also is intended to apply to the third day, Well, there are a number of texts, passages, where divine deliverance occurs on the third day. For example, in Hosea chapter 6, 1 and 2. In Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. 2 Kings 20, verse 5. And there also may be another little play on this. That the third day on which Jesus was raised, that particular third day was the first day of the week. It was a Sunday. And we see in Leviticus 23. Verses 10 and 11 and verse 15, 
that the day of the first fruits, that's the day the first fruits of the harvest are offered to the Lord. And Jesus, as you'll see, is going to be described as the first fruits. So it may be talking about that. So I, I, I give that to you. Now, the fourth item of the creed is that he was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. And this part is so important to Paul that he, he appends four more appearances to those two. Like that's part of the creed. And then Paul adds four more appearances to those two because it's so important that he wants people to recognize, see, that Jesus' resurrection wasn't simply some spiritual existence. He was raised from the dead and he was seen by many witnesses on a variety of occasions. And here in, six, in verses 6 through 8, he recounts those other appearances of the resurrected Christ. And he ends with the Lord's appearance to him on the Damascus road, where the Lord Jesus appeared to Paul. And in referring to himself, it's this interesting term, to himself as one untimely born. Paul is probably picking up a derogatory label that some of the Corinthians had applied to him with regard to his supposedly undeveloped spirituality. And this phrase, one untimely born, it was used to refer to a birth after an abnormal gestation period. It included abortions, it included miscarriages, and it carries the sense of some kind of deficiency. See, it has some kind of deficiency. And so in 9 and 10, then Paul digresses about his apostleship. Having used that term, which is probably something that was applied to him, he takes it. And then in 9 and 10, he digresses about his apostleship and he doesn't disown the label untimely born. He doesn't disown that as a term of his relative worthlessness. But he uses it to once again exalt the grace of God in his life. He doesn't say, no, 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 no. He takes it and then uses it to exalt God's grace. Whatever his weakness in relation to the other apostles, God graciously called him to serve as an apostle, whether they like it or not. See, God graciously called to serve, for him to serve as an apostle, and he says that that grace in his life, it motivated and empowered him so that he labored more abundantly than all the other apostles. So they're over here saying, yes, yes, yes. You know, he's one untimely one. He has some kind of deficiency. He has this undeveloped spirituality. And Paul says, God's grace in my life, he called me and that motivated me, that empowered me so that I labored. I just was pouring it out in service to God, in gratitude for what he's given me. And then in verse 11, Paul returns to the point of the paragraph, which is namely that the gospel which is preached by all the apostles, the gospel that the Corinthians believed includes the resurrection of Christ. That is fundamental. And I don't think we always appreciate how fundamental it is to believe the truth of the resurrection. You know, in Romans 10, 9, he says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is an important thing. Then Paul says in 15, 12 to 19, but if Christ is preached that he's been raised from the dead, how does some among you say that there is not a resurrection of the dead, plural, the dead ones? How do you say that? Now, if there is not a resurrection of the dead ones, neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then empty indeed is our preaching, and empty also is your faith. And also we're found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, neither... Has Christ been raised? And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is useless. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If only for this life we've hoped in Christ, we are more pitiable than all men. 
Now, Paul here, he says, look, given that the gospel, the message that is preached by all the apostles, given that the gospel includes the resurrection of the dead and buried Christ, Paul wants to know, how can some of you claim that there is no resurrection of the dead? You see, in his view, which is the Spirit's view, in his view, you see, the future resurrection of Christians is so inextricably linked to the resurrection of Christ. They are part of one harvest, as he'll specify in the next paragraph, that to deny the one is to deny the other. That's what he says in verse 13 and in verse 16. Again, it is like lightning and thunder. To deny the thunder is to deny the lightning. And that is the link that you see here. J.C. Becker, a New Testament theologian, he rightly observed in his book, Paul the Apostle, The Triumph of God in Life and Thought. He says, indeed, according to Paul, the gospel is integrally connected with his apocalyptic worldview. He cannot conceive of the resurrection of Christ, which the Corinthians affirm, apart from from the apocalyptic resurrection of the dead, the end time resurrection. Both stand or fall together. Richard Oster, who's a uh, professor of Bible at Harding School of Theology, he was one of my professors. He says, Paul turns the argument, this is in his commentary on 1 Corinthians. He says, Paul turns the argument to demonstrate the logical consequences of the position of these Corinthians if they, rather than Paul, are correct. Since the Apostle's argument rests upon the premise of an inextricable link between the believers and Jesus' resurrection, he reasons that disbelief in the general resurrection of believers logically leads to disbelief in Christ's resurrection. Mark Taylor, in his commentary on New American Commentary series, I think it was published in 2014, he says, Paul's premise, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised, indicates that the deniers of resurrection in Corinth did not contest the resurrection of Christ. Yet the major premise of Paul's logic is that to deny the resurrection of the dead generally excludes, to die the resurrection of the dead generally excludes even the resurrection of Jesus. So I want you to see what's at stake here and what's going on and why this is so important. Now Paul says, look, he says, if it is true, your denial of the general resurrection, of the resurrection of the dead, implicitly is a denial of the resurrection of Jesus. And if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, all kinds of stuff flows from that. All kinds of things flow from that. He says, if it is true that Christ was not raised from the dead, this is in verse 14, he says, look, if that's the case, well, then neither the apostles' preaching nor the Corinthians' faith has any basis in reality. It has, it has no basis in reality, and thus neither has any significance or value. Our preaching, your belief, they're nothing. They don't mean anything. You see, if Christ has not been raised, then empty indeed is our preaching. Empty also is your faith. They don't do anything. They have, they have, they have no value. Now that's pretty important. He says in verse 15 that if that's the case, then the apostles are liars. He doesn't mince words. He doesn't say, oh, they can be harmonized and put together. He says, no, if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, we are flat-out liars. We testify that God raised Jesus from the dead. We're not mincing words. We're, not, we're telling you flat-out he raised him from the dead. And if you're telling me that the dead aren't raised, which implies Jesus wasn't raised, if Jesus wasn't raised, then you're saying we're lying to you. That's the consequence of what it is that you're saying. Now notice the resurrection again of Christ is part of the gospel message. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, a descendant of David, according to my gospel. Raised from the dead. The Corinthians, another item here, 
Verse 17, if it is true that Jesus has not been raised, well, the Corinthians' faith is useless. And as such, what? They're still in their sins. If Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, this is all a lie. And so, you are, your faith is useless. And that means what? That means that you are still in your sins and therefore alienated from God and under just wrath. So that's a consequence of what you're talking about. And if Jesus has not been raised, then those who died believing in Christ, well, they're just, they're just perished. They're lost. They have no hope of future blessing. That's it. All the people you've known and loved, they're just, they've perished. This idea that you're going to be with them, it just perished. You see that they have no hope. The hope that you're hanging on to. Now, if the Christian's hope in Christ, he says in verse 19, if it is limited to this life, if there is no resurrection of the dead as some Corinthians claim, then Christianity is a lie and those who have given their hearts and souls to it are due the utmost pity. No, 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 you say, no, 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 this is not true. You still live the good life. They are saps because they have arranged their life around something that is a lie, a fable. They have organized and lived and devoted their lives to something that is baloney and nonsense. And he says, if that's the case, then we are due the utmost pity because we are the utmost sap. You say, well, are you saying that, that Christianity doesn't have a good life? No, I'm not saying that. There are good things about it, but what I'm saying is that the struggles... Paul was kicked all over the Mediterranean world. You know, Christianity involves sacrifice. It involves doing without it. It involves trying to follow the Master and taking all of your selfish impulses and saying, I'm going to do what the Lord wants me to do. Though there's a part of me that wants this and wants that and wants that, I'm going to say, I follow you, Lord. All of that denial, all of the persecution people like Paul faced, you know, what does Paul say in 2 Corinthians 4, 17? For the lightness of our affliction, which is momentary, is producing for us far beyond all measure an eternal weight of glory. You see, if it's all a lie, well, then we're due pity. We're not to be going, oh, that was okay. No, we're, we have organized and lived our lives and surrendered our lives and had every part of our lives determined by a fable. And we are fools and are to be pitied. But he says in verse 20 to 28, <clears throat> But as it is, you see, if that's the case, if Christ hasn't been raised, then all of these things flow from that. But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead. He has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, those who have died. The first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a man, also the resurrection of the dead came through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. The first fruits, Christ, then those who are of Christ at his coming, then the end. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he brings to an end every ruler and every authority and power, for he, Christ, must reign until he, Christ, has put all the enemies under his feet, the last enemy is brought to an end, namely death. For he, God the Father, has subjected all things under his, Christ's feet. Now when it says that all things have been subjected, it is clear that it is with the exception of the one who subjected the Father, the one who subjected all things to Him, the Son. And when all things are subjected to Him, when Jesus comes and finalizes and asserts that authority that was given to Him, then even the Son Himself will be subjected to the one, the Father, who subjected all things to Him, so that God may be all in all. Now tell me this isn't a great chapter. 
I just want to float, baby. This is like great. All right. Paul says, look, if what you're saying, the implication of your denial of the resurrection of Christians is that Jesus himself, he wasn't raised. If that's true, all of these things flow from it. These negative things flow from it. He says, but the fact of the matter is that Christ has been raised from the dead and is the first fruits of the end time resurrection. His resurrection serves as a pledge or a guarantee on God's part of the final end time harvest. Jesus' resurrection is the lightning. Ours is the thunder. That's the connection. Here's what David Garland says about first fruits. And I think a lot of times we simply see first fruits in terms, in terms of precedence, but we miss the larger implication of it. He says, David Garland says in his commentary on 1 Corinthians, <clears throat> the term first fruits does not simply signify Christ's chronological precedence as the first one raised from the dead, however. It conveys that his resurrection is the first of a kind involving the rest in its character or destiny. That is why Paul says that Christ is the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep, not of the resurrected. His resurrection was not simply God's miraculous intervention that rescued him from death, but was the beginning of God's renewal of all things. Now, I've told you before that the common first century Jewish understanding was bodily resurrection at the last day when God judged and remade the world. That was the common first century Jewish understanding, and I talked about that again last week. So you say, well, what's going on with Jesus' resurrection? What they didn't expect was that this resurrection that they thought was an exclusively final phenomenon, had already been dragged into the present in the, person of a, in, in the person of Jesus. So that that resurrection has already begun while the old age or order continues on. So that's this overlap of ages that I've talked about. That's what blew their mind. That's what they weren't expecting. They all expected a resurrection. What they couldn't get their mind around was that that resurrection event has already begun in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Anyway, he goes on. He says the concepts of first fruits expects that the rest must follow. Holman contends that by choosing this term, Paul presents Jesus' resurrection as the beginning of of the eschatological resurrection. As the first fruits, Christ's resurrection is a pledge of the full harvest of resurrection to come. The resurrection bodies of the redeemed are to correspond and flow from Christ in the same way that the harvest corresponds to and flows from its first fruits. Now just so that you... Uh, let me impress this on you because I think the concept of first fruits is important because it shows that we are all part of one harvest. Murray Harris, in his book, Raised Immortal, Resurrection and Immortality in the New Testament, he's a New Testament scholar, he says the first fruits are related to the harvest as the part is to the whole. Compare the use of first fruits in Romans 11, 6, 16. As the first part of the harvest, the first fruits were representative of the whole harvest. That is, the total harvest was representatively and potentially present in the first fruits. So it is that the whole, of which the resurrection of Christ is the first part, is the resurrection of those who belong to Christ. The resurrection of all believers is the necessary aftermath of the resurrection of Christ since the two are intrinsically connected, belonging as they do to a single harvest. Now I'm up, up here talking. Uh, I'm hoping you're hearing this. This is important. Stephen Wellam in his book, uh, 26, it just came out last year, called uh, God the Son Incarnate. He's a uh, theologian. He says, just as the first fruits of the harvest are a foretaste of the full harvest, so Christ's resurrection anticipates and ensures the believer's resurrection. It is God's down payment, a pledge that the final eschatological end 
is surely coming. It has already begun. It has already begun in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The new age has invaded. It has been pulled into the present. And it overlaps until Jesus returns and everything that is contrary to God's eternal vision is then stripped out. You see, and then the rest goes on eternally. So I just think this is, uh, this is good stuff. Our resurrection is tied to Christ's resurrection. So much so that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, Paul says, we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Jesus was raised back here thousands of years ago. How is he going to raise us with all same harvest? All one harvest. And Paul, and Paul says, you see that, that he'll raise us with Jesus. And we're all the same harvest. He, Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, as he says in Colossians 1.18 and Revelation 1.5. Implying what? He's the firstborn from the dead. Others are following. He's not the only one born from the dead. He's the firstborn from the dead. Everything in an order. Christ and then the rest of the harvest. First fruits, rest of the harvest. And so that's what he's talking about. And, and we as part of the Lord's resurrection harvest will likewise receive glorified and immortal bodies in the resurrection. That's Jesus' body, right? Imperishable, immortal. Jesus was subject to death. He died. But what happened with the resurrection? What does Paul say in Romans chapter 6, verse 9? Well, something happened now. Romans chapter 6, verse 9, Jesus Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. Why? Because he has been resurrected. He has been raised immortal, imperishable. The very things that Paul is going to say how we're going to be raised. But this is what has happened. So here, this is we're going to, Paul can't be clearer in my judgment on this. When Paul says in Romans 8, and if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will also, Jesus raised flesh and bone, Although transformed, although immortal, although imperishable, although no longer subject to death. How does he describe it? Flesh and bone. But he says, the dead will also give life to what? Your mortal bodies. The body that is subject to death that is mortal, he will give life to that. He will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. 8.23. And not only that, but even ourselves, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. We ourselves also groan in ourselves while eagerly awaiting our, adop our adoption as sons, the redemption of our what? Bodies. As you'll hear later, that's inherently physical. Okay? As Robert Gundry in his study, Soma in Biblical Theology, that's the word for body. There's an inherent physicality in Paul's use of the word body when he speaks of people. All right, Romans 8, 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined, we often, I think, miss this, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Paul says in Philippians 3, 20, 21, For our commonwealth exists in heaven, from where also we eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, what? who will transform the body of our humiliation. When Jesus came in Philippians 2, doesn't he come into a state of humiliation? His body is subject to death. Resurrection, death no longer has mastery over him. He's immortal, he's imperishable. So he says to transform the body of our humiliation into conformity with the body of his glory by working of his power even to subject all things to himself. John 3, 2. Beloved, we are now children of God and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We do know that when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Jack Cottrell is a uh, professor of Bible at Cincinnati Bible College. He is part of the Restoration Movement. That's Christian church. But he's pretty close to us in the Restoration Movement. He's a well-known theologian. He trained at Princeton. Cottrell, in his book, his uh, real systematic theology, Face once, The Faith Once for All Bible Doctrine for Today, Cottrell says the, the second phase, you see what Christ's body, it is the model or the prototype 
of our resurrection bodies. His resurrection body. He says the second phase of the new creation will be the day of the second coming of Jesus when all the redeemed will receive new glorified bodies. Most will receive them at the moment of resurrection itself, but living believers will receive them in an instantaneous change. So not everyone will be resurrected. The dead will be resurrected. They will be raised, transformed, but those who are here when the Lord returns will simply be transformed. You see, they will be transformed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. This event is called the redemption of our body. And Paul says this is what we're, we're waiting eagerly for. Romans 8, 23. See 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 5. The glorified resurrection of, of body of Jesus is the prototype or model after which our own glorified bodies will be patterned. Jesus will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. This is what Paul means when he says that, he, that foreknown believers are predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. That is, our own new bodies will be of the same nature as the glorified human body of Jesus. We will be like him because we will see him as he is, 1 John 3, 2. That is, we shall be like him in his human bodily nature, not his divine nature. So it's the prototype. You see, it is the prototype and I think that's something that's important. Now you guys uh, shout if the second bell goes off because I'm on a roll. That's why Jesus said, that's why Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all what? Who are in the tombs? All who are in the tombs will hear his voice and what? Come out! All who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, that's the one Paul focuses on, and those who've done evil to the resurrection of judgment. You see, it's very important here. This is the raising up that will occur at the last day. That's what Jesus says in John chapter 6, 39 and 40, John 6, 44, John 6, 54. And in verse 22, Paul explains that this consequence of Christ, he explains this consequence of Christ's resurrection in terms of the Adam-Christ parallel. You see, just as death is the inevitable consequence of our connection to Adam, so resurrection is the inevitable consequence of our connection to Christ. And as I say, here of course Paul is focusing, he's referring on the resurrection of life that Jesus spoke about in John 5, 21, not the resurrection to judgment. So Paul's aware of both. He makes that clear in Acts 24, 15. But he's here focusing, just as he does in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, his focus is on the resurrection of life. That's what he's talking about. Lord willing, I'll pick up here next week. Thanks for coming. It just occurred to me, uh, Bernard wanted me to tap my microphone and I didn't do that. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Wherever you are, Bernard, I'm tapping it now because he's trying to sync up the audio and the video when something happens, and he said that would help him, and he asked me to do it right away. Sorry, my brother. 